Hello, everyone. Good morning to those of you in the US and uh, good afternoon or good evening for those of you joining in Europe. Uh, I'd like to introduce myself. I'm Sam Butcher, one of the scientific collaboration specialists here at Labster, and this is our webinar on flipped science teaching. So welcome, everybody. I hope you enjoy today's session. We have two brilliant speakers here joining us today. And before I hand over to the first speaker, I would just like to go over the agenda and some practical details. So all of you as attendees will be in listen-only mode throughout the webinar, but we welcome you to ask questions via the question tool throughout the session. If you have a question for a specific person, please start with their name and your question. We will do our best to cover them all at the end of the webinar during the wrap-up and Q&A, but of course uh, we'll only be able to answer some questions if we have lots of them, depending on the amount of time that uh, we have available for the Q&A session. Today's webinar is being recorded and we will be using the recording on our YouTube channel and potentially on other channels following the webinar. So please uh, do bear that in mind. And uh, it does mean that, of course, you'll be able to share the recording with anyone who you feel uh, may be interested in checking out today's session. Uh, you will find today's presentation and the McMaster case study attached as PDF files, and you'll be able to download those uh, if you uh, please after the session. For the agenda, just to quickly talk you through what we'll cover today, following my introduction, I'll hand over to Catherine Thomas Varco, the Managing Director of Mirabooks and the, sorry, Mirabook Tr Development Trust CIC. I'll give a quick five minute overview of Labster, what it is that we do and the, uh, the concepts behind our design principles and the simulations that we've developed. And then I will hand over to the brilliant Felicia Volku, the uh, first academic in Canada to use Labster's virtual lab simulations and assistant professor at McMaster University. We'll then wrap up and cover a, uh, a 10 to 15, 10 minute Q&A session. And uh, with that in mind, I would like to hand over to our first speaker, Kathy. So Kathy, as I mentioned, is the Managing Director of Mirabook Development Trust, uh, CIC. Mirabook provides wraparound online learning services and reinvests the profits from this work into developing free online learning for children and young people. Kathy has a phenomenal 17 years of experience working in higher education environments with a particular focus on the development of online distance learning and teaching with technology. Prior to her current post, she was the lead for distance learning at the University of Manchester, a learning consultant for the Open University and the distance learning publication manager at the Royal College of Nursing Institute. Kathy has been involved in all aspects of online course development and delivery, including curriculum development, research and writing, quality assurance and teaching. The courses have ranged from foundation programs to non-credit bearing CPD, to diploma, to undergraduate degree and postgraduate level. Kathy will be sharing with us her insights and her expert tips on the what's, the why's and the how's of flipped science teaching. And with that, Kathy, I'll hand over to you. Kathy, please uh, take it away. Thank you. I'm just going to share my screen with you. Okie doke. Um, so thanks for that, Sam. Um, and thank you also to Labster um, for giving me the opportunity to talk to you all about flipped teaching. Um, in terms of, you know, as all good teachers do, in terms of the aims of this presentation, uh, I'd like for you to be able to go away knowing what flipped teaching is if you don't already, um, why you should consider it if you haven't already, and how you might go about introducing it if you haven't already. So I'm going to start by throwing out what to some of you might seem like a slightly controversial statement, so I hope I'm not going to shock anybody too much, um, and that is that higher education um, is less about the information you're teaching, which will often become very outdated in a profession and more about developing the skills your learners will need moving forward. And when I'm talking about skills, I'm thinking about things like inquiry skills, uh, critical thinking skills, your ability to apply theory, evaluation, analysis, I could go on. Um, so I feel as though for teachers these days, our role is to teach students how to survive 
survive in employment uh, when they leave university, but more so how to survive their profession actually as it evolves um, and how to inquire, how to think critically about new research, how to apply new research. Um, we need to ask ourselves actually a key question and that in my view is um, how much of this skill development is actually taking place in traditional lectures and on the whole I'd suggest it's probably not really happening. Um, so I'd like us to explore flip teaching as an alternative to the traditional lectures and for us to do that we need to understand what flip teaching is. Um, so according to the uh, UK Higher Education Academy um, they would suggest as you can see there that flip teaching is a pedagogical approach in which the conventional notion of classroom based learning is inverted so that students are introduced to the learning material before class with classroom time then being used to deepen understanding through discussion with peers and problem solving activities facilitated by teachers. Now I don't know about you but that seems like a bit of a mouthful to me and there's a lot of big words in there so let's unpick that a little bit. Traditional classroom based learning involves getting students the information and then getting them to do homework where that, that learning is then applied. Whereas with flipped teaching we turn that on its head um, and the students are given the information part of their learning before they come to class uh, so that they can then come to class and engage in activities where that learning is then applied. Um, so let's have a look at what that looks like in a blended context. So blended learning is I'm sure most of you know um, is it involves a mix of online learning and face-to-face -face learning. Um, so generally in a flipped context, online learning will be used to deliver the theoretical content prior to coming into class. Um, and in terms of that, the, the online learning can take many forms. Uh, so as you can see in the box there, uh, they can be teacher created and the online learning might be things like PowerPoint presentations, uh, podcasts, video demonstrations, even um, university made uh, interactive uh, lessons of, of various sorts. Um, they can also be third party created. Uh, so an example might be actually labs to laboratory sims that we're talking about today. Uh, might be YouTube videos that are third party created, could be book chapters, there's a myriad of resources available. But they can also be student created and this is something that's often overlooked actually, um, is that it, there's opportunity there to build into assessment that students can actually create resources that can be used online um, as, as resources for other students, either within that cohort or for subsequent cohorts actually. Um, and those resources could themselves include things like PowerPoint presentations, videos, audios. In, in this day of the smartphone, it's very easy for students to throw together a video and an audio. Um, and, and there you have an online resource. In terms of the classroom context, how you use that uh, can vary enormously depending on your students and the learning outcomes that you have. Uh, so some examples can include, as you can see there in the yellow box, um, a problem solving classroom. Uh, and what I mean by this is where students are able to work independently or in groups on problem based learning scenarios. Uh, a discussion classroom uh, where students are able to discuss, debate, analyze, evaluate learning. A practical classroom where the students might be able to engage in practical skill development on the back of video demonstrations that they've had delivered online. Uh, a group work classroom where students can work collectively on an activity to learn from one another or possibly even critique the thinking of others, which obviously is a, a higher order learning um, that you're, in, you're getting students to engage in there. Um, and then finally, a one-to-one -one instruction classroom. Now this is another often overlooked thing and, and is particularly good for mature students um, where actually sometimes in doing this flipped kind of teaching actually removes the need um, for classrooms um, in some instances and the students can then have a one-to-one -one instruction um, uh, based on their individual learning needs. Uh, so, so now we've got a good sense of what flipped teaching is, um, let's look at why we should consider it. So in this section um, we're going to look a little bit more closely at some of the reasons to flip your classroom um, and uh, we'll look at it, it, it as, sorry, look at it as a way to engage different learning styles, uh, use learner differences as 
resources, promote social learning, develop higher level skills and to actively engage students. But I'm going to start with good old Bloom um, and I'm sure most of you are aware of Bloom's taxonomy of learning. Um, and for those of you who haven't, and uh, Bloom chaired a committee of educators who undertook a review of education in the 1950s. So this is quite an old but very seminal piece of work. Um, the report that they produced, that committee, um, introduced the, this concept of Bloom's taxonomy of learning. And this model suggested that uh, learning objectives could be classified into three domains. There's the cognitive domain, the effective domain, and the sensory domain. And in the cognitive domain or the knowledge domain, if you like, um, learning objectives can be broken down into six levels, as you can see there. Uh, so something of a pyramid of sorts. So on the bottom of the pyramid, uh, you have remember, uh, which is where students are able to recognise and recall facts. Uh, on the next level, you have understand, uh, where students are able to understand uh, what the facts mean. Uh, you have apply, uh, where we can apply those concepts to different contexts. Analyze, when we can break down the information into its component parts. Evaluate, uh, when we judge the value of information or ideas. And then finally create, when we're able to combine parts to make a new whole. So something that's original at that point. Um, and Bloom's thinking is that the, the broad base of the pyramid is, is where the majority of learning takes, takes place, hence it has the broader um, at the bottom of the pyramid, um, and that's remember and understand. But actually, what we should be aiming to do is to move students to um, a higher level skills, which are actually of more importance and will serve them better in the longer term. So we need to try and move students into that realm. Uh, so, in essence, what we need to do is to move to a taxonomy that looks a little bit more like this. Um, and so, uh, obviously, you can see at the base of that uh, figure that there is still a place for remembering and understanding, but it's not predominant. Um, and student effort needs to be focused more on applying and creating and evaluating and, anal and analysing. And this is what flipped teaching, in my opinion, enables uh, students can gain their information and understanding in online activities and then develop higher order skills in the classroom. So flipped teaching um, is also suggested to promote more active learning. In 1993, uh, Myers and Jones suggested that active learning involved providing opportunities for students to meaningfully talk and listen, write, read and reflect on the content ideas, issues and concerns of an academic subject. So in essence, uh, they're, ref sorry, they're referring to the movement of the concept of students as sponges or empty vessels, if you like, that we fill with information and knowledge. Um, to, so we're moving from that, moving to students being active creators and active participants in learning, as you can see in the figure there. But flipped teaching also promotes social learning. In 2006, Wilson and Peterson suggested that, that although solitude and peaceful silence provide good opportunities to learn, that uh, social occasions of conversation, discussion, joint work and debate also play a critical role in learning. Um, and there, there are a myriad of um, social learning theories that I'm sure a lot of you are aware of, uh, social construction, Activism um, suggests that knowledge is constructed by interacting with, it's about um, knowing by doing. Um, Socio-cultural theory suggests that learning takes place between individuals in communities, and that community can obviously be a classroom community. Activity theory suggests that the amount of learning we can do individually is limited, um, but when we work with with others, we achieve a higher level of learning. So again, as an individual, we, we sort of have a threshold, if you like, of learning. But actually, in working with others, they're able to draw us beyond that th that threshold through through that shared learning experience. Um, and Vygotsky re refers to that as the zone of proximity. Um, so a great deal of Social learning is based on the premise that learner, learners come with different experiences, capacities, understandings and backgrounds. And these individual differences produce 
a, a range of ideas and problem solving strategies for student discussion and reflection. As educators, we often perceive this um, as a bit of a complication at times, actually, if I'm to be quite frank. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's difficult, isn't it, to teach a, a diverse group of students. Um, but actually, um, in a flipped teaching context, what we would like to suggest is that actually Actually, uh, we need to embrace learner differences, um, that they're actually a resource that we can exploit in the classroom. So it, instead of um, using that time to de deliver that didactic lecture and not knowing where to pick that lecture, um, you, you can have students, uh, you know, sort of access that theoretical content online, they come into the classroom and then collectively um, between them, they're able to inform one another um, and, and use those, um, those different as a resource. Um, and we can also suggest that flip teaching engages different learning styles. Um, I'm sure you're familiar with Gardner, some of you, um, in 1983, um, suggested that there were eight different learning styles. To run through them quickly there, um, bodily, uh, so we learn through physical experience, interpersonal, we learn by interacting, uh, verbal and linguistic, uh, we learn through written, verbal and heard language. Logical and mathematical is where we learn through questioning and experimenting. Uh, naturalistic is learning through experiential learning. Intrapersonal is an independent learning. Visual is learning through visualization and images. Musical through the transfer of information through music. So not all students learn in the same way. Some students are very visual learners, some are very verbal, some are very inter personal. However, traditional lectures tend to only engage a few different learning types, whereas flip teaching has the power to engage many different types, depending on the activities that you create online, depending on the activities that you create in the classroom environment. Uh, so I can talk to you about the, the flip theory learning, sorry, the, um, the uh, flip learning theory, I should say, um, for hours, uh, but that's all theoretical. So what we really need to do is look at the evidence base. And there's been a great many studies conducted, and I would encourage you all to read some. Um, the general consensus is that flip teaching promotes um, improved problem solving. It promotes higher exam grades. It promotes higher overall grades on an entire program. And it also promotes a decrease in student withdrawals and, and, and deferrals, which is a very uh, interesting sort of aside, actually. Um, but let's have a look at a couple of uh, case studies um, to have a look in a little more detail. So there's a study that was published by Day just earlier this year, um, and that was uh, for students uh, undertaking a gross anatomy course on a doctor of physical therapy. Um, this study involved a control group of 105 students in a flip trial of 112. Uh, the students showed um, that, sorry, the results showed that the students in the flipped group had an increased semester average grade. They performed better on higher level analytical questions. They improved long term retention and knowledge transfer, performed better on a subsequent course. And it's particularly worth noting that the lower performing students outperformed their control group counterparts. Um, so I think that's that's a really interesting piece of information that and and actually um, in some classroom um, work that I've been involved in in um, in some other areas that has also demonstrated that which was an interesting aside. Um, and then secondly, we have a, another study here by Casasola et al. In 2017. Uh, this was a larger study, uh, 612 students on an undergraduate chemistry course. Uh, 240 students were in the control group, 372 in the flipped group. Um, the lectures for the course were all moved online. Um, so this enabled them to use the class time for problem solving and examples. Um, one of the aims of the study was to identify is flipped teaching impacting um, student interest in a subject? subject or improve, improve study skills. Um, now, the way they chose to assess that was through self-reporting. Um, so interestingly, the students did not report a significant change, actually. However, um, attendance was higher for the flipped course, um, which would demonstrate that there was a higher um, sense of engagement, actually. 
um, results were higher. There was a statistically significant increase in the grades, um, and, and but also but for the subsequent chemistry course. So this is demonstrating that there's a, a longer term um, sort of learning effect that's happening there as well. Um, so now we know what flip teaching is and why we should perhaps consider it. Uh, let's look at how to implement it. Um, so how do we move from a traditional lecture to a flipped teaching um, sort of a learning scenario? Um, and in my opinion, uh, we need to, uh, first of all, in terms of learning styles, uh, move from uh, passive learning to more active learning and also more individual learning to more group work. Um, so we need to consider that. Um, in terms of knowledge um, that we impart, uh, we have to consider moving from just facts and procedures to also in adding another layer of uh, to that uh, to include arguments, concepts, inquiry, all of those higher level skills. Um, and we need to, in terms of teaching style, uh, change from being predominantly an information deliverer um, to have included in our role um, that of facilitator and also more importantly Importantly, that of architect of, of educative experiences. And I really like that concept. I'd quite like that as a job, uh, job title, actually, architect of educative experiences. Um, and then um, finally, in terms of lesson content, uh, we need to move from that low level um, of, of content to sort of a higher level of content um, that's delivered in a format that's going to engage those different learning styles that we talked about before from Gardner. And what are my top tips? Um, so my top tips are, my top five tips would be, the first one is that um, I, I think it's probably no secret that sometimes, not all the time, but us educators quite often like to control learning. Um, so my first top tip is actually, we need to learn how to relinquish that. Um, we need to learn how to be this architect of learning that I was just talking about and to embrace to a certain extent a little bit of chaos that comes with flip teaching because if you're getting students in the class to engage in debate and discussion that is what will happen but ultimately the educators that do embrace flip teaching often report improvements in their own teaching actually which is really great to see. So that's my first tip. My second tip um, would be to to um, map out your program and consider what parts of your program can be delivered online and what parts need to be delivered in class. So that would be my second tip. My third tip would be when considering class time, ask yourself what activities can you create to get students to move to the higher levels of learning, to develop those important skills that we talked about in Bloom's taxonomy before, you know, analysis, um, evaluation, those sorts of skills. And then my third tip would be, in terms of your online content, how, how can you mix it up? You know, how are you going to attract those different learning, engage those different learning styles? So how will you can deliver that content online? So you need to think about readings, videos, online interactive games, quizzes, things like that. There's a lot of stuff around once you start looking. And then finally, my fifth tip would be, to think really early about how you're going to evaluate all of this. So I think sometimes this is something that we overlook because actually, um, if you start thinking early about that, what you might find is that when you're developing your online learning resources, you can actually build into that some online evaluations actually. Um, and so it's just, it pays to, to think of that evaluation early. Other evaluation types might obviously be the traditional um, you know, sort of written evaluation um, in the classroom context. It might be that you have a, a board that as they exit the room and you ask them to put a smiley face or a happy face on the board, depending on how they felt the session went um, or something. So there's lots of different things, obviously, that you'll be aware of that you can embrace there. So just to kind of wrap up a bit, really, I opened the presentation with a somewhat controversial statement um, that higher education is less about the content you are teaching um, which will often become outdated and more about developing those skills that students are going to need moving forward. Um, and we questioned whether traditional lectures allowed this kind of skill development. And um, I suggested that flipped teaching might be a better option. I hope um, that I've demonstrated 
demonstrated to you what flipped teaching is, um, why you should perhaps consider it, and how you might go about implementing it. Um, I'm, I'm happy to take any questions, um, and I'd also like to point out that my email address is on the slide that you're hopefully all seeing at the moment, um, and you can also contact me through Mirabook's Facebook, Twitter, and my personal LinkedIn as well. Um, so I hope you'll keep in touch, and I'm going to hand back to Sam. Thank you so much, Cathy, for that very interesting and very insightful presentation. I I'm sure we're going to have lots of questions for you, but uh, I think what we'll do is uh, wait until we are at the end of the session because I, I can see that there's nothing coming in urgently now. So before I hand over to the next speaker, Felicia, I want to just take a few minutes to talk everyone through uh, a couple of uh, bits of information around the, the history of the company, the simulations that we've developed, and the, and the design principles that underline the simulations that we've built, particularly for flipped teaching approaches. So, Labster started out in Copenhagen in 2012 as an outreach project. Our founder, Mads Bond, wanted to find a way to engage high school students in the local Copenhagen area. and what he came up with as a solution was a computer game style version of a lab practical exercise that he had hoped to run with these high school kids. The simulations between 2012 and now have evolved over time to become uh, much more of a teaching tool than an engagement tool. And part of the approach that we've developed is focused around some core design principles that are designed to improve the student experience within science courses at high school, at college, and at university level. So the design of the simulations is focused around addressing key challenges that science educators feed back to us as being really uh, detrimental in some respects to uh, student science education. One of them is the knowledge gap, and this often relates to, uh, in particular, the, the beginning stages of a university undergraduate degree, where students will come in with a very wide range of different skill levels and backgrounds. Some students will know some of the scientific content very clearly and will have had experience working in a lab with pieces of lab equipment before. Others will be seeing this equipment for the very first time. Now it can of course make it a challenge then to teach to such a wide range of skill sets and what we aim to do here is to provide students with a self-paced, self-directed learning experience that will cover all of those key learning goals and I'll touch upon a little bit some of the impact of those simulations a little bit later on with some of the interesting studies that have been conducted into the use of these simulations. The second is limited access to lab space. Now, this is a huge challenge for just about all science educators around the world. Science labs are expensive, and as a result, it's often hard to get students into the lab as often as you would like to as an educator. So what we've looked to do with these simulations is build a digital version, in many respects, of the types of lab practical experiments that you would like to run with students using real experimental data and the ability to change variables within that lab environment to address some of those key challenges by expanding the access that students have to laboratory-based education by removing to some extent the need for the physical lab space. The next challenge that we look to address is poor levels of student engagement and we do some quite interesting and creative things here around storytelling that I'll touch upon in a moment. We also look at addressing how students arrive to lab practical sessions, how students prepare themselves for the lab and uh, what we really focus on here is bridging the gap between the theory that students will typically learn in a lecture and the work that those students will then be doing in the physical lab space. So uh, really what we're looking at here is uh, another type of flipped teaching approach. In the addition to flipping a classroom, a, a lecture for example, we're looking at flipping the lab here by effectively preparing students for that physical work that they do in the lab. And then finally, we addressed poor conceptual understanding. And we have to be quite frank here, learning within the sciences is hard. Students are presented with abstract concepts that hold very little uh, 
basis in students' everyday life. And that can cause a lot of challenges, just simply down to the fact that students aren't able to build strong neural connections with other things that they observe on a daily basis or will understand from other areas of their education. So what we focus on here is helping students to bridge the scientific work that they're doing with its real world relevance, its real world impact. And basing all of these design challenges and principles in mind, we've developed a set of web-based virtual laboratory simulations. It currently sits at 74 simulations that incorporate all of these principles and look a little something like this. So when a student goes into one of our virtual labs for the first time, what they will be presented with is an hour typically an hour, 45 minutes to an hour long learning experience that covers everything that would normally be covered by the student in one lab practical session and one to two lectures worth of materials. So the first thing that students will see is some element of storytelling. This is where we relate what the students are working on within the lab to its real world relevance and impact. This could be anything from collecting a sample from a rainforest that will go on to become the precursor for a new novel medicine. It could be the creation of a new uh, personal medicine, the murder of a professor by an unknown assailant, and students will have to work through a crime scene investigation case to identify the assailant. Once students have worked through that initial contextualization, they will be presented with a digital version of the real lab practical that they would work through in the physical lab. Students will work through the standard protocols and the standard steps that they would work through within a real lab, covering the safety protocols, the, uh, the standard um, putting on of a, uh, a lab coat, gloves, goggles, for example. And through the process of working through this scientific protocol, they will be able to change variables, they will be able to interact with elements that, as they would do in a real physical lab, it could be anything from streaking an agar plate to running a, uh, a titration experiment. However, instead of being a simple digitized version of a real lab practical experiment, we're able to do some quite interesting interactive elements with the students at a cellular and molecular level. And this is very much designed to allow students to, uh, as I mentioned before, bridge the gap between the theory that they work on in lectures and the work that they're doing in that physical lab setting. We then provide analytics tools that will allow academics to identify knowledge gaps within the student cohort. So you could identify, for example, the top five areas of the theory where students are struggling with the most. This could be observed through the fact that they are breaking pieces of equipment, the fact that they're answering questions incorrectly. So from a flipped classroom perspective, this can be a very powerful tool as it allows you to go into that classroom setting with the students present, knowing exactly where students need the most support from you as an academic and where they uh, are struggling the most, so to speak. So. Of course, it's important for us to understand how best to build these simulations, but it's equally important for us to understand through our collaborations with our university partners and research partners, how best to build these simulations into courses. Now, one of the key initial ways in which this is done is through simple safety training. We build safety simulations to help help students to conduct themselves safely within a real physical lab environment by going through those safety protocols beforehand. And not just going through the standard protocols, but also learning how to react when something does go wrong within a lab. And of course, it's much safer to practice how to address something that's gone wrong in a virtual lab than it is to in a physical lab setting. The next thing that we work on is simulating equipment that would typically be inaccessible to students because of the time, space, equipment or cost restraints that often come into play with physical labs. It could be, for example, that you want to give students access to an electron microscope, but because of the prohibitive cost, it's not possible to do so, or at least not with the amount of time that you would like those students to have with that piece of equipment. The next piece is the pre-lab exercise, flipping the laboratory, so to speak, by providing students with a digital immersive version beforehand that helps them to bridge the theory that they would be learning within 
in the course to the work that they would be doing within that real lab environment. We also work on in-class activities and of course flipped classroom teaching and this is what I wanted to touch upon a little bit more today because this is uh, of course the, the most relevant part of this, uh, this session. This is a study published in Nature Biotechnology back in 2014 that demonstrates the impact of Labster when used in combination with traditional teaching in a lecture environment. When Combining the two, what was observed was a 101% increase in learning outcomes compared to traditional teaching in a lecture alone. So students effectively learned twice as much by going through that same material beforehand in a virtual lab in a self-paced and self-directed manner, and then building upon that with a uh, an academic present in a classroom environment. Now. This alone is a very positive result and something that I think is not necessarily just testament to the impact of the simulations, but also testament to the flipped classroom approach, more generally speaking. However, most interestingly for me within this study, what was found was 40 days later, in the retention test, it was found statistically significantly that there was no change, no drop off in student scores. So they had retained that information gained using this flipped classroom approach very, very well. Now, I'm going to loop back to something I mentioned at the start when I talked through the design principles behind Labster. It has been observed that through using these types of simulations, particularly with them being self-paced and self-directed, giving students the opportunity to work through things uh, at their own pace and at their own level, um, we've had observed that students with poorer levels of baseline knowledge by far and large have the greatest impact from these simulations both in terms of improvements in knowledge but also in self-efficacy so of course self-efficacy being a key indicator of improved learning this is a very positive um, indicator for us that these simulations are a, uh, a very powerful tool to use particularly for foundation or uh, undergraduate levels when students are being presented with scientific theory or being presented with a laboratory environment and equipment within that environment for the very first time so that's everything from me. I'm going to hand over to Felicia now. And uh, I just want to uh, uh, quickly mention that uh, Felicia has been working with us at, uh, at Labster for a couple of years now. And we've done some really exciting and interesting things. We've uh, collaborated with uh, Felicia, who's done some brilliant work developing a MOOC called uh, DNA Decoded, which is on the Coursera platform, which I'd highly recommend you all check out. We're also exploring doing some uh, some research together on virtual reality labs. So uh, we should hopefully have some updates on uh, that for you very soon. But uh, Felicia Volku is, uh, as I mentioned earlier, the assistant professor at McMaster University within the biochemistry and biomedical sciences department. And she will now share with us how she has flipped the lab by using labs as virtual lab simulations in the biochemistry laboratory course and what the outcome has been both in terms of learning outcomes but also in terms of student engagement and motivation. So uh, I think that's enough from me. Felicia, I'm going to hand over to you now. So uh, Felicia, take it away. Thanks, Sam. So um, hello, everybody. And uh, just give me one second to put this on. There we go. I hope you can see this. Uh, so as Sam very kindly introduced me, my name is Felicia, and I'm an assistant professor in the Department of Biochemistry and Biomedical Sciences in beautiful McMaster University, Canada. Um, what I want to do today is very, very quickly um, take you through um, a case study and how I used Labster lab simulations in a biochemistry laboratory course. Um, so what I want to do first is tell you the course name, Biochemistry 206. I'm going to take you through how the course is set up, uh, the course objectives, and how I was able to actually implement the Labster simulations as a flipped lab uh, experience. I'm going to... I, I, I uh, surveyed the students to see what their take on it was. So I'm going to show you some of their feedback and end off with some of my feedback and um, some of my tips and tricks. So let's get started. So uh, Biochemistry 206 is a full year course offered by our department. 
This means that it starts in September and it ends off in April. Uh, I am the only course instructor for it, and I typically get about 140 to 150 uh, biochem students. So these are students that have just entered our program as we are a second year entry program. The way that I, uh, so it's a, it's a big course, and the way that I um, keep them uh, engaged, one of the ways is to separate them into three laboratory sections. So I typically have 50 students per section. If you ever want to find me uh, on Wednesday and Thursday and Friday afternoons, just come down to the teaching labs from 1.30 to 5.30 and I am there with our students. Um, and the way the course is set up is to introduce the students and engage them in a uh, directed research project. And the way that's set up is in term one, we focus on DNA. So uh, the students go through 12 weeks in term one uh, working on a molecular cloning project. Then in term two, we focus them on proteins and they spend the 12 weeks uh, from January to April working on a protein characterization um, of, a drug, of a known drug target. The way that their each week looks like for these students is um, they come to two lecture based uh, to, to two lectures. There are 50 minutes each and then a four hour lab time. Typically, the labs don't last four hour, but four hours. OK, so the uh, course objective for biochemistry 2006, we have our typical technical skills that we want to introduce our students to and communication skills with respect to technical skills. Uh, skills. Uh, we have uh, an introduction to basic techniques like molecular cloning, protein characterization, cell-based assays, for example. In terms of the communication skills area, we want our students to be introduced to scientific communication, uh, such as oral and written, and the lab notebook, which everyone finds very tedious at the beginning. Um, throughout this, of course, we really want to also emphasize transferable skills like grit, perseverance, motivation, failure and how to deal with it, as well as optimism. And the way to marry all of these things together and engage the students and help them to see connections between all of these complex skill acquisition um, is to engage them through things like flipped labs or flipped classrooms. Um, and I have done this in two major ways. The one that I want to focus on today is the Labster vir virtual lab simulations, which I've implemented for the past two years as a pre-lab um, exercise. But I also have um, another flipped lab experience called the Team Think Tanks, or T3s. You'll note that I like to name things. Uh, sorry about that. Um, this is sort of a team-based learning exercise. What I do is I put my students in year-long teams. And throughout the course, I actually take out lab time where the students can meet in their teams and design very a various aspects of their research project. So for example, one of the things that they do in term one is to PCR amplify their gene of interest interest and their first think tank as a team before they go into the lab is to design their own primers so that that is super fun for everybody all right now before I go into the actual flipped class um, exercise and sort of give you an idea of how I incorporate it everything I want to sort of uh, give you a little tip from my own personal experiences um, if you're going to set up anything that um, involves active learning and engaging students where you are one of the you are the facilitator um, or the architect uh, as Kathy so wonderfully put it uh, of, of your environment you at first need to create a very positive nurturing and safe course environment um, if you have this in place then flipping your class or your lab becomes a uh, very easy and much more successful this is in my own personal experience so for every one of my courses this is our course mantra which i'm very transparent with the students about in our course every voice matters every individual is treated with respect dignity and equality and the idea is to establish a safe inviting and caring environment conducive to um to, to learning and to dialogue. The biggest thing is to be a very positive environment and everyone has to share in this responsibility. So this is my biggest tip uh, for those of you who wanna do anything that's active learning, flipping the classroom. Okay, getting back on course. Um, so what I wanna do right now is kind of show you how the terms are set up. Term one, remember it's 12 weeks and term two is also 12 weeks. So in term one, what I'm showing you here is the wet lab components. 
So you can see lab one to lab five, uh, and you haven't counted wrong, there are only five. You, you go from pipetting basics and PCR, where the students PCR amplified their gene of interest. They then digest their gene and incorporate it into a, and insert it into a, uh, uh, an expression plasmid, um, and so on and so forth, until they get to lab five, where they've actually created uh, a, a plasmid containing their gene of interest. Um, and then in term two, they pick up where they left off by taking that plasmid, and then expressing the protein, purifying it. Um, and here we, we switch between uh, from, from uh, different years. Uh, some years I do uh, kinetic assays and dose response curves. Other years uh, we do protein crystallography. So, you know, this is just an example of, of actually, I like the protein crystallography part. It's my favorite. Anyways, now you'll notice that each of the terms um, have only five wet labs, but each term has 12 weeks total. So I use the other lab times uh, to incorporate team think tanks, as I show here. So I've given you an example whereby uh, the students get into teams and they actually design their PCR primers right before lab one. I order those primers per team and then they test them in lab one. Um, other team think tanks are actually used to, uh, once the students have, let's say, run an agarose gel, trying to identify whether they were successful in PCR amplifying their gene of interest, and then we get the data, and then they can create scientific figures and figure captions. So that would be another example of a team think tank. Uh, but the other thing that I've, I've been doing is to actually map Labster uh, lab simulations. This year, I've used them in the class time, so I flipped the class times uh, for the most part, and I've been playing these lab simulations at the same time as the students during the class time. It has been super fun, I've had a blast. Anyway, so as you can see here, for example, in term one, uh, I've given you some examples of some of the Labster lab simulations that I've used. I do move them around and I use different ones. So this is, these are just some examples. So for example, here, in, right before they start their lab one, we as a class go through the lab safety simulation. It is super cool because it allows me to stop at various areas and to, really um, showcase or highlight to the students uh, things that I really want them to pay attention to because they will be doing it in the lab as well. Um, as well, students absolutely love watching me play video games. I wasn't a huge video game uh, player when I was uh, smaller, like Nintendo, you know, <laughs> um, so I'm very awkward, which I think they love. Um, I did happened to, um, I did manage to survey them as well. I really like to survey my students both informally as well as formally, just to make sure that um, what I think is happening in my classroom really is happening and it's not just in my head. Um, so for example, in this, on this slide, I've asked the students, well, I've given the students a number of statements. So I've point of, uh, I've, I'm describing here four of them on the left of this uh, bar graph. And I've asked them to rank each of these statements on a five point uh, Likert scale. So really agree, agree, disagree, really disagree, or not applicable. So for example, you will notice here, uh, oh, sorry, I am, the numbers here are the percent of total student respondents, just to, just to give you a, a layout of the land here. Um, so for example, uh, it is easy to use Labster. Uh, most of the students agreed that that is the case. Um, it seems like they're very happy to play the virtual labs and it keeps them quite engaged. What really floored me actually, and I wasn't even gonna ask this question, I wanted to know if they like going through the Labster simulation in class play, with me playing along with them. And like, they really loved it. And I could actually tell because um, my class attendance was through the roof, which is awesome. It's always nice to feel wanted. Um, the other thing um, is I asked them a couple of questions and they were giving me uh, a, a written, written answers. So one of the questions I asked them was, can you describe some of your favorite Labster features? Um, and I was able to, I, I read all of their answers and I was able to um, sort of classify them and summarize them in trends. Uh, so I saw a lot of connections to our biochemistry 1206 course content to the wet labs in there. So for example, when I asked them what are some of their favorite Labster features, a direct student quote would be, Labster helps you walk through the labs before you actually complete them. That's music to my ears because that was my objective. Uh, some of the other um, 
uh, trends that I noticed here was that the students thought that lobster had similar experimental procedures to the actual wet lab. The, the lobster storylines helped solidify the importance of the techniques. So that was very nice. Um, students also commented on their favorite lobster features with respect to the virtual lab environment and the platform. Um, so here's a good student uh, comment, how real everything is. I love how we actually need to put on gloves, change pipette tips, etc. Again, this is music to my ears, but um, just, just of note, I gave them this feedback after they completed most of the lobster simulations, because when we started doing the lobster simulations, they were grumbling about this. They didn't like to change their, their pipette tips all the time until they got into the actual lab environment and they just they realized just how important that is so i thought that was the bee's knees when i when i read this so again students really like the real life laboratory feel and also the creative and relevant storylines and finally some of the students commented on their favorite lobster features with respect to the lobster assessment so uh, when students go through these uh, labs virtual labs um, they actually get quizzes as they move through the lab itself. Um, they're multiple choice quizzes, and they also have a theory page so they can actually visit um, some of the theory if they're a little bit cloudy on it. Um, so they really enjoyed the use of the lab pad, which directs them through this whole thing, and the theory pages behind each question and the ability for them to be able to assess um, um, to, 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 to go to the theory page if they needed it. So again, they thought the quizzes were fair, engaging, and also fair waiting. Um, the, the last question that I asked them, which is sort of a future thing, um, that a future, uh, which is a feature of lobster that's coming down the line, and I find it really cool. Um, Biochemistry 1206, the, uh, this course, I actually created my own courseware. Uh, it's a physical courseware that students purchase from our bookstore and they use it throughout the entire year. Um, so I asked them how they would feel about Lobster incorporating the 1206 courseware content into some of their theory pages and some of their virtual labs. And the answer was a resounding 100% yes. Um, they feel that that would really enhance their understanding of the lab. So this is something that I'm really keen to do to in order to really um, incorporate Lobster as part of, of the course. Now, I have some feedback as well that I want to touch on before, before I'm finished, so bear with me. Uh, moving forward, so for this coming September, I plan on wrapping Labster into the team think tanks as a pre as well as post lab exercise. So a, a good example of this would be at the end of term one, the students uh, would have successfully cloned their gene of interest into their expression plasmid. Uh, we then get this gene sequenced uh, using Sanger sequencing. We don't actually do it in the lab. Those are the old days. Um, and then um, what I would like to do is get them to go into their team think tanks, analyze their data, and then conduct uh, the Labster next generation sequencing simulation because I can't do next generation sequencing with them. Um, the other thing that I'm doing right now in September, um, which is really awesome, is to actually introduce a, about a two week uh, CSI or crime scene investigation uh, module at the beginning of the course to really grab the students and really engage them in in science. And the reason I'm able to do this, as as um, Samuel uh, mentioned, is because um, uh, in in collaboration with Sam McPherson Institute and a colleague of mine, um, uh, Caitlin Malarkey, um, we, we were able to successfully create a massive open online course, a MOOC called DNA Decoded, that is now available for everyone on Coursera. Here is the link here. So I'm going to have the students watch videos, select videos from the DNA Decoded MOOC on Coursera, specific, specifically ones um, uh, looking at DNA in forensics. After they watch this, then I'm going to have a traditional lecture where I go through DNA and forensics, key concepts of DNA fingerprinting, so on and so forth. Then the students are going to meet in, in team think tanks and conduct the Labster CSI labs, where teams will go through the actual virtual lab simulation and identify the murderer. Um, and then I'm going to give them their own case and we're going to go in the lab and identify our own murderer uh, using um, PCR and agarose gel electrophoresis. So this is a really, um, a really nice, tight um, module that not only showcases to the students what DNA, the power of DNA in forensics, but also introduces them 
and really connects all of these different techniques um, to real life situations. Um, so my final thoughts looking back in the last two years that I've incorporated Labster in this specific course, to be honest with you, I'm, I'm, I'm being 100% uh, genuine here. I really think Labster is a great product. Um, it's a great product for the students and it was a, it's, it's ended up being an amazing product for me as, a, as, a, as a, an instructor because I'm able to take what I thought was a really good course, taking students through a research project and take it to different heights by introducing to students that the research project that they're doing um, has a lot of merit, but, but it can also be um, utilized in real life situations and, it, and in situations that I normally could never ever um, uh, duplicate in the lab. Um, I do have a couple of, of tips here. If you do decide to use this in a flipped class or lab experience, reflect very deeply on how to incorporate Labster in your course structure. Make it exciting for the students, be extremely engaged and transparent in this entire process. Always ask for feedback, both for a formal and non, not formal, uh, doesn't need, always need to be formal, from students and constantly adapt. And the, the biggest one is to have a very positive attitude, you know, sometimes incorporating um, more, uh, different platforms or flipping something can be very uh, frustrating at times until you get the hang of it. It's extremely vulnerable. Uh, if you want to know what that is, ask me. Um, but it can also be a lot of fun if you have the right um, attitude towards it. Um, that's it for me. Thank you very much for your time. And if you have any questions now, awesome. I think Sam's going to do this, so I don't want to take over his job. But if you have any questions outside the webinar time, uh, please, or, or if you want to collaborate with something or you just want, to, um, want me to see your course outline and how you can fit things, I'm, I'm very open to that. Uh, feel free to email me and the email is, is here. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you so much, Felicia. It was so interesting to hear about how you've been building labs to simulations into your course and how the students have found using the simulations. Um, before we wrap up, we still have some time left for questions. So we're going to jump into a Q&A session now. Um, just while we do so, I wanted to ask a request of everyone. We really appreciate any feedback that you have for us, and we would love for you to send through any recommendations that you have for what we can cover in our upcoming sessions. So please do let us know if you have any recommendations. and. Uh, with that in mind, I'm just going to jump straight in. I believe we have a, a couple of questions that have come through already. So the first that I can see is from uh, uh, Chaja from uh, um, Tuskegee University. Um, Chaja asks, my question is, how can you make sure that the student who is registered in the course is the one who is doing the labs to lab? Very interesting question. I do have a couple of thoughts on that myself. Uh, before I go into anything, I just wondered if, Felicia, you have any thoughts on this or if you've had any experience in this area, if you had similar concerns, any observations. So, um, Felicia, just to, sorry to put you on the spot, but do you oh, have no. any thoughts on this yourself? I'm on the spot all the time, don't worry. Um, one of the, uh, the, the things is that um, the students have to register with their McMaster email, so obviously they can, they can uh, um, fake that, I guess. Uh, but the other thing is I usually, um, they go through our learning management system as well, um, so that's another thing. Um, those are the only things, I mean, they can, they can, they can totally, um, I guess they can navigate those pretty well. Um, that's the only thing I can think of. <laughs> Thank you so much. Uh, so uh, the, the input that I have on this is uh, that there's a couple of things to bear in mind here, and that is that one, typically these simulations are not used in such a way that they are a formal assessment piece where students receive a grade depending on how they scored within the, the simulation and said students are given a mark for completion of the simulation. And it's certainly our observation that students aren't really incentivized and aren't interested in cheating in that kind of way when they simply have to complete the simulation. So uh, we don't see this happening very much. 
Um, but of course, it is just certainly something to bear in mind. If you are going to give students a grade uh, as part of a module that is weighted on how they achieve with the simulations, that certainly could be a danger. But because grades are normally given for completion of a simulation and because students enjoy using the simulations, it tends to be the case that this doesn't happen, certainly from our experience. And I don't believe we've had any reported cases of this happening. Uh, the next question comes in from, actually, in fact, the next uh, two questions come in from AJ Lee. Uh, the first of them, Felicia, is your syllabus for the biochem class online and potentially available for us to have a look at? Um, I think if you Google it, it could be online, but I can provide it um, to, uh, to the um, organizers for sure. No problem. Excellent, and we can get that sent out along with the uh, the slide decks, the presentation from today's session and the rest of the hands out. I believe there was a question earlier uh, about whether or not these slides would be available. They absolutely will, and they'll be sent through to you at the end of the session. So uh, thank you so much for that answer, uh, Felicia. Thank you so much for the question, AJ. Now I have uh, another one online. Oh, it, it appears that it, actually that was a, uh, a duplicate of the same question. So I'm going to move on to another question from Joy. Hello, Joy. Yeah, great to have you on the call. Um, so Felicia, here's another question for you. How long did it take you to fully incorporate Labster into your course? Did you go all in or did you take an iterative process to slowly incorporate over a semester or academic year? I actually remember this, Felicia. I remember coming out to see you over the uh, the summer period on my first trip out to Canada. But I will let you answer this one as well, if you don't mind. And uh, it'd be great to, to hear your thoughts on the process. No problem, Sam. Uh, yeah, so I usually go all in all the time, which is never like the best idea. However, it's all in. But um, I, I took an approach whereby in my first year, um, I sort of assigned it to the students outside of the class time because I was also learning the platform and I was learning how to navigate with things. And um, it was a new company I was dealing with and I was worried about um, you know, if there was technical issues. Um, so one of the things I did is, uh, it was just for participation. So very slowly we were going through it. Then I realized that whenever there was technical issues, Labster got to it like right away. So they're very good, they're very supportive in that way. And um, I, I obtained feedback from the students and they really liked the scenarios, they liked the feel of it, but they wished it was more incorporated in the actual course content. So this year I incorporated and I played with them and I incorporated um, um, the labs a lot better so that they fit with my syllabus and that really helped because Labster started developing more and more labs that would fit into it. So what I would say is like a stepwise uh, integration so that you can get used to the platform and then keep re, um, keep immersing it so that Lobster content almost becomes the like intertwined with your content. But I think it'll take a couple of iterations. I don't know if that answered it. Excellent. No, that's uh, perfect. Thank you so much for that, Felicia. I really appreciate it. Uh, so I can see that we have a, a couple more questions. Uh, so, uh, Kathy, we have one here from uh, Helen Gedegaard from our team. Hello, Helen. Great to have you on the call. Kathy, would you recommend we build courses starting with materials like Labster or starting from the assessments? Now, sorry, <laughs> um, my um, my personal opinion is that um, that uh, learning has to be driven by the learning outcomes, obviously, and then we assess against those learning outcomes. So everything has to start from the learning outcomes, actually. Um, but those learning outcomes can be um, reflective of, of the the idea that you're going to incorporate Labster into that. So you can. Have actually start to have uh, learning outcomes that are skill based, um, not just knowledge based. Um, and um, so, so, so that's an interesting concept for, for us there as well. I hope that helps. Excellent. Cathy, thank you so much for that answer. Really appreciate it. I can see that we just have two more questions. I know that I'm, I'm getting the heads up to wrap up. Uh, one question from Kirsty. Uh, 
uh, Christy, do we have labs to simulations for the clinical laboratory? We absolutely do. If you go to the labs to website and click on the simulations page, you'll see uh, hematology simulations, microbiology, and a few others. Uh, there's absolutely some content on there that would be a good fit. And please do reach out to me at sam at labster.com if you would like some more details or some course mapping. And then uh, I believe that we have to wrap up now. So. Uh, Thank you so much, everyone, for joining us for this session. I really appreciate uh, you all taking the time, and I hope that this has been useful for us. Again, please, if you get a chance, do send through some feedback and suggestions for the next session. We will be sending the recording out to you. You will receive all of the handouts, including the uh, the slide decks and the, uh, the McMaster case study from Felicia. So uh, once again, thank you all so much for your time. Enjoy the rest of your day, everyone. And uh, that's it from me. Thank you, and uh, goodbye. Thank you. Thank you.